up now. So, uh, we're going to sing one you all know. So you stand up. Just trust me, you know it. Everybody say, when the saints go marching in. Everybody say that. When the saints go marching in. When the saints go marching in.
Intermission, technical breakdown. Big <laughs> show. I don't want to. She's being. Okay. Let's try it again. You got to start all the way from the beginning now? Let's not say we did it. What it means to have when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine.
But this day and night, when I find myself. Surrounded by your glory, what will, will my heart do? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Even though you be still, will I stand in your presence? To the knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all?
Father, we just love you this morning. We give you praise. We give you glory. We just thank you for being such a good God, such a faithful God. Lord, we just ask you to bless each and every one that's here. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You too. You can go sit down. She said, I want that mic. <laughs> Didn't she do a good job? I don't think she's very shy. She may play shy once in a while. That's just great. Well, the Lord bless you all. Good to have you with us this morning. And uh, we're just going to have a great time in the Lord. I have a few announcements. One is that we have Bible study on Wednesday night. And you're all invited. Some people say, well, I think that's just the guys. Well, we do have guys that come here from the ranch. But you're all invited to come. And this Wednesday is going to be special. But I'm not going to tell you just what yet. But... Uh, but we have over almost 200 verses that were memorized from, those, from the people that come on Wednesday night. So it's called the Eagle's Nest, and we're having a good time. And so we invite you all just to come and enjoy it. So if you'd like to support us, we got a lot of things going on. And if you, yes, children, you may escape. And if you would like to support us out there at uh, our ministry here, it is P.O. Box 788, Lucerne Valley, California, 92356. Just making sure you all know that. And you're more than welcome to come. Ralph has a few words of wisdom for us now. Okay, you know I like to tell stories about my life. This uh, Thursday was my wife's birthday, and uh, so we had a dinner for her and stuff like that. And then we, I, went, I went into the bathroom with one of the one of the guys, and he says, "You want to hear a dirty?" You know, he didn't say a dirty joke. He says, "You want to hear a joke?" And and the Lord said, "No, you don't want to hear a joke." I said, "Yes, I'll hear it." So he said the joke and I laughed and we came out and he, and he kept on saying things that was totally against God. And I knew it and I didn't have the guts to say, I don't want to hear that anymore. So Friday I was working in the yard and Saturday I was working in the yard. And that's when I do a lot of praying and stuff like that. And I felt God was telling me, Call that man up and tell him that you are sorry for the way you talked to him, too, because I was talking, too. And uh, so I called him, and he's a, he's a new Christian. I've been a Christian for 38 years, and he's a, he's a brand-new Christian, and I was talking to him like that. So God convicted me, and I called him, and I told him, you know, I'm very sorry for talking to you like that, because that's not what God wants. And I told him, you know what God wants, bro? He says, yeah, I know what he wants. He wants you to be good. I said, that's not true. Yeah, to be good. But the thing is, you can be do the best thing that you think you ever done on this earth. To God, it don't mean a darn thing. It's what he did on the cross. That's why we're going to go to heaven. It ain't anything that we do good. And I, you know, I told him all these things. And I said, you know, that's not right. And, let me, and then so I still felt kind of bad for her. I was ashamed to call him, but I said, I'm going to do it because God is pushing me. And this and then I got in the house and I started reading the Bible. And this is what the Bible says. The spirit in himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's all of us here that accept Jesus in their life. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in us, in me. And then, because you know what? Sin is always there. We're always ready to sin. We sin every day. We wake up in the morning, we're already sinning before we even tell the Lord, good morning. Okay, this and this is the last one. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. 
he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give you give life to you to your mortal body through his spirit who is dwelling in you so we have the spirit in us and you know even though, even though we, 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 we sin and sin sometimes we sin we don't want to come to church but you need to come to church God didn't say you're not going to sin anymore God did all the work and that, and that doesn't give us a right to sin, okay? I don't want to sin because I love him. When you love him, you want to do what he tells you to do. And uh, it, it doesn't, and, and you feel 100% better when you're doing what God tells you to do and uh, not doing your thing because your thing is all screwed up. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know it is. It's all screwed up. We think crazy and stuff like that. But I have a Lord that I can turn my life over to and say, forgive me, God. I'm going to keep on going on. And that's me now. And I tell you this every Sunday. I'm going to keep walking and walking and walking until those doors open and Jesus says, come on in, Ralph. Amen. That's my goal in life. And that should be all of your goals. Okay, now let's say a prayer. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that you came down to save us, Lord. It's not because we drank or we said a bad word. We're forgiven for all that already. So we don't have to walk around feeling guilty for what we do anymore. But we don't want to sin anymore, Lord. We want to do what you want us to tell us to do, Lord. And I just love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> well, it's pretty amazing. You figure just a couple of months ago he couldn't read at all. <laughs> and that's God. So he's been memorizing the scripture and in memorizing the scripture he's taught himself how to read and he's working on preaching pretty good one day pretty good and I think Mike has a special for us now this is called Broken I open my heart and let Jesus 
We talk about a lot of things, but I want to talk about our worship team just a little bit. You know, we've just been blessed. Cal and Shara have been doing this for us for over 20 years now. And, yeah. and it's just been a tremendous blessing. And you just don't know unless you've been up here where I'm at and in charge of something, that uh, to find a good group that is faithful like this is just quite amazing, really. And we just want to tip our hat and Say thank you and God bless you this morning because we talk about other things all the time. So once in a while we need to give the, uh, the people that are uh, all beat up from digging a well. <laughs> and they just do a great job and we really appreciate having them here and doing this. Well, I want to talk to you about a real sensitive subject this morning. So don't turn off your TVs and you all don't go to sleep. I want to talk to you about giving. Uh-oh, amen. Oh, oh, oh. And I want to ask you a question. So are, are you a cheerful giver? Amen. Yes. 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 Are you a cheerful giver? Okay. And what's it mean to really give? Is it legalistic? Are we talking about monetary? Are we talking about your wallet? Or are we talking about you? All of the above. <laughs> yeah. My conviction is that if you take care of your relationship between you and God, your wallet will take care of itself. Amen. When you talk about giving in the book of Malachi chapter 3, you can go there if you want to. We're going to get there eventually, I think, this morning. But it's one of the main chapters on tithing and offering. And it asks the question, will a man rob God? And he's talking about the nation of Israel. But long before he gets there, back up in verse 1, he talks about the Son of Man coming and who shall stand when he appears. And he talks about getting right with God long before he talks about materialistic things. Yes, God has an economy. Yes, church needs money. Yes, all that kind of stuff. Sure. But what's more important is the condition of your heart. And do you know how to give? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? All thy heart. All thy heart, all thy... With everything, right? So I was looking up cheerful giver, taken out of one of the verses of 2 Corinthians. And it's interesting because several of the commentaries kept referring back, or commentators kept referring back to a Olympic way back in 1924, Eric Liddell. You might know him because he was featured, his life story was featured in the movie Chariots of Fire about 25 years ago. Anybody remember Chariots of Fire? Or am I just telling on myself? Okay. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, you ought to see it. It's a great movie. But it's talking about Eric Liddell, who was born in China, the son of Chinese missionaries from Europe. And then when he got old enough to school, he went on to Europe to get educated, went on to college there studied to be a scientist and a missionary. Played rugby and all that thing, but he got known for his speed. But he was a devout Christian, very strong Christian. But he got known for his speed by playing rugby and he ended up in the 1924 Olympics. And he was to run the 100-yard dash and he refused to do so because they ran on Sunday. And that was his best event. And he by far and away was the favorite to win. 
He ended up running the 400 meter in a different day and won. And they claim it was probably the most amazing 400 meters ever ran. You can look it up and study it yourself. It's amazing. During that race, he got tripped by another competitor. And by the time he picked himself up off the ground, there were some 20 feet or so ahead of him. The whole crowd passed him. And he picked himself up and he ran with all of his heart, overcame the group, won the race and set a world record after falling down. He collapsed because of his running. And in preparation for all of this, his sister asked him about his commitment to Christ and his missionary work. And he said, well, God made me fast. And this was a principle by what he lived with. He said, God made me fast, so I need to use what God gave me for God's glory. I need to use what God gave me for God's glory. I'm going to say it one more time because I want to burn that phrase into your brain. I need to use what God gave me for his glory. It is even said today among a lot of sports experts that that was their greatest 400 meter race ever ran. 1924. Well, now he has fame. <coughs> He's in the newspaper. He's being talked about. He's got a chance to make a lot of money. But he decides to go back to China and be a missionary. You see, he was also highly educated. A scientist studied science, pure science, and went back to China to preach, lead people to the Lord, and teach science to the Chinese. Well, soon, the Japanese war, the Japanese came close to China. The war started there before it started here. It actually started there in China about 1937. Eric put his family and sent them to Canada to get out of harm's way. And he went back to China to deal with the people. Again, preaching and teaching to the people and filling the needs of the needy, going from village to village with food and supplies and trying to take care of the people best he could. But the war was raging on and soon he became an internment. He lived, he was taken, he was told that he would have to be, go to a camp, a prison camp, and be interred and he had so many days. <coughs> so now this champion who had all of this talent notoriety in Europe, opportunity to be wealthy and whatever. Now he puts his belongings in a knapsack, puts them on his back, and he marches to a camp where he's interred as a prisoner. Immediately, he preaches and organizes and teaches the prisoners and tries to take care of them the best he can. Even the operators of the camp in which he was in recognize he's a special, and they put him in charge of several housing projects, and he takes care of the people better than his enemies could. Oftentimes, they said that he even gave up his own ration for those who needed it. And he preached the gospel to the prisoners. Everywhere he went, he used what God gave him for God's glory. In 1945, he died of brain tumor that was developed while he was interred in a prison camp. The whole prison camp came to honor his burial. They saw a light in Eric Liddell that they hadn't seen in very many. He sets the example on what God means. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. You see, he gave it all. He took what God gave him, both his brains 
his learning, his athletic ability, and he, whatever he endeavored, he did it for the glory of God. My pleasure, he told his sister when she was condemning him, he said, no, God made me fast. I need to use what God made, gave me for his glory. Wow, what a lesson we can learn <clears throat> from Eric, Eric Liddell. See, it's not about your wallet. It's really about your heart. When you talk about giving, or you're talking about service, or you're talking about serving the Lord, or you're talking about honoring the Lord, it's really about your heart. When that's in place, the rest of it all handles itself, takes, falls in place. In 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, it says, But this I say, who who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. So let us give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Wow, listen to the amplified version of that same verse. Let each one give as he has made up his own mind and purpose in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion, for God loves, he takes pleasure in, prizes above all others, and is unwilling to abandon a cheerful, joyous, prompt, giver whose heart is in his giving when you give to God whether it be of your time or whether it be of your work or whether it be of your substance are you cheerful in that by the way if you don't know the big box in the back is an offering <laughs> box back there just in case you didn't know that yeah. giving doesn't start with your wallet Starts with your heart. Amen. You might ask yourself, what's an example of what did God give you? How did God give you? How did God give to you? For God so what? That he that he what? That he gave. What did he give? He gave of himself, his son. Why? That you might have life and have it more abundantly. Wow. And Malachi starts with a person, which is an interesting chapter in the Old Testament language because they're getting ready to meet the Lord. Malachi chapter 3, it says, Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's, some translations say fuller, and other ones say launderer's, soap. I want to talk about that just a little bit because that was an old, ancient way of refining gold. And they take lead, actually, was part of the process. But what was very, I don't want to get into all the science of it, but it was very interesting. Basically, what they took is they took the raw material and they heated it to some 16, 1800 Fahrenheit, extremely hot, and at the right time they would produce oxygen into it, and the gross would float to the top, and the caretaker would skim the gross or the waste off the top, and they'd put it in a special cup. But they didn't do it once, they did it several times. But what's interesting about it is, is that in this process, it's being purified by heat. Everybody said it was purified, purified. By, heat. by heat. But it had to be the exact temperature. The operator had to know exactly when to introduce the oxygen into the process so it would work. So it was important for the operator to be there all the time it, the material was in the fire. What do you think the author is trying to tell us? 
You may think you're in the fire sometimes. Maybe you're being processed by God, being purified by God. But Jesus is always there, attending to the heat, attending to the process, making you into his own image. Amazing. The photo of soap was interesting. You know, and you know how they, he knew when it was done, when he had a finished product? Because it was so pure, it shined like a light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And that your good works may glorify your Father which is in heaven. The refiners, the fuller soap, or the longer air soap, was taken from a special plant. The ashes of a special plant was mixed with oils. And they would take the wool and they would soak it in this solution. And they would tread on it, they'd beat on it, they'd even walk on it to get rid of all, to raise all the dirt and the dust and all the chemicals, whatever it had in it. And they would soak it in there until it became white as snow. Ralph talked about sin this morning. How was your heart? How many know Jesus as your personal savior? then your heart is white as snow. Amen. You may have made some mistakes. My little children, I would that you sin not. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, who is a propitiation for your sins, which means substitute sacrifice. And not for yours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He's standing at the right hand of the Father, Say, no, Ralph, you're okay. I've paid for that sin already. Go about your father's business. You're free. See, that's how much the Lord loves you. He's made a way of escape for you. And you need to know that. But also you need to know that you need to serve him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And so the fire purifies us so we shine like a light. The soap purifies where our sins become white as snow. See, that's what it means when it talks about a refiner's fire and a fuller soap, a launder of soap. God's, that's a process. Everybody said it's a process. 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 How, how many of you woke up perfect this morning? <laughs> it's a process. And we're all being processed right now by the Holy Spirit into the likeness of Christ. And sometimes it may take the fire. And sometimes it may take the soap. But it's all done because God knows what's in you. He's not trying to condemn you. He's not trying to belittle you. He's not trying to beat you down. What he's trying to do is draw out from what is inside you the man and the woman that he loves so you can be the best you can be for him. And so he works with us all the time. Wow. It's interesting because when he starts there in verse 2, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. And he will sit as a, refin as a refiner and a purifier of silver and who will purify the sons of Levi. Who are the Levites? Well, that was one of the tribes of Israel. Who were they? They were the priests. Okay. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? I want to talk to you Christians again. Know ye not that you Christians, both out there and here, you are what? You are the temple of what? The Holy Spirit. What's that make you? Priest. priest. Everybody say, I, I am, am the priest, priest of this temple. Of this temple. Wow. 
What a verse for that, 2 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. How many say, everybody say, I, I am, am peculiar. <laughs> that means special people. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous what? Light. Light. But he doesn't leave you. He never leaves the process. He's with you, just like the operator back there, turning up the heat or looking at the heat or checking the heat and checking the metal. And he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Everybody say, when he's done... The words of Job, when he has tried me, I shall come forth what? Gold. As pure gold. See, God's processing you so you come forth as pure gold. Sometimes we kick and fuss at the process. Sometimes we're going to ask for healing. And that's the last thing we need. We need to just say, Lord, here am I. Work on me. Whoa, gets quiet in church sometimes. <laughs> that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. See, if you're not right with God, God doesn't need your money. You need to give it to God. Amen. Why? Because it's an exercise of your faith. You need to decide between God and you what you need to do. That's between you and God. In the Old Testament, it's a tither. I'm a tither. I'm a 10 percenter. That's just me. That may not be you. In Corinthians, it says, as a man purposed in his own heart. But that's connected to your wallet. God's financing. That you be offered to the Lord an offering in righteousness. See, if it's not done in righteousness, if it's not done with a proper attitude, if it's not done in sacrifice to the Lord, then it's really not much good. Because my father owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He doesn't need your money. He's going to get by just, right, just fine without you. And after God gives you a bath like never before, then you're ready to give a righteous offering with the right attitude. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord. And in the days of, as in the days of old, as in former years, See, you're just giving back to God what he's already given to you. How many of you know you don't own anything? You're just a steward of what you got. All your gifts and everything you got, God's given it to you. So like Glendale said, no. He said, I need to run, sis, because God's made me fast. Sounds simple enough. So God's made me fast. So I need to use what God gave me for his glory. God's given me this ability. He's given me this talent for a reason. And I need you to use it for his glory. I'm going to China to be an educator, to be a missionary, to be a preacher. God's given me this education. He's given me this ability. He's given me this intellect. He's given me this desire. I need to go do what God has given me, use what God has given me for God's glory. And you need to use what God's given you for his glory. Amen. And let it be righteous. Not begrudgingly, but from the heart. And I will come and judge you, and I will be swift against the saucers, against, you know, all the fruits of the flesh. I am the Lord. I'm the one that's in charge, for I am the Lord, and I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. See, he had made promises to their father. And he told them, Abraham, that his seed would be like the stars in the sky and like the sand on the sea. So he wasn't going to destroy them even though they were disobedient. Anybody ever disobey God? <laughs> but God said, yet in the days of your father, you have gone away from me and my ordinances, and I have not, and you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. Boy, is that a simple promise? 
It's straightforward, right in your face, right? What's God saying? You come to me, and I'll come to you. You be obedient to me, and I'll be, I'll be good to you. As a prodigal son has finally decided to turn from his sin and go home to his father, what does father do? As soon as he saw his son, he ran to him and wrapped his arms around him. And that's what God will do for us, each and every one of us. How many would like to just be hugged by God? Amen. Amen. Wow. Returning, but they said, we have never left you. See, they were self-righteous. There are a lot of people in church that are self-righteous. <laughs> we have never left you. But yes, you have. You know? We have all robbed God in some ways. And then Jesus answers them. He answers them with a question. Will a man rob God? Think about that for a minute. Will a man rob God? Will a woman rob God? Can a person rob God? How can a man rob God? Not talking about your wallet. How about you? I put a little list down there. Many ways to rob God. One of the first ones of oneself. Recognition of who he is, really is. Of worship. Of adoration. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed. Be. That's adoration, exhortation, honor, service, loyalty, obedience, love. Are we withholding any of those from God? If you are, then you're robbing God. Wow. But the good news is God says, no, come on to me, return to me, and I'll return to you. And I'll wash your sins and become whiter than snow. Wow. What do you have to do? You just got to give it all to God. You got to let him put you in the furnace. You got to let him soak in the soap. Everybody soak. 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 Say soap. Soak. 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 In the soap. In the soap. Say that ten times real fast. <laughs> soak. Soak. soak in the soap. Bring all your tithes, verse 10, bring all your tithes into the warehouse that there may food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out you a blessing that there will be no room enough to receive it. You see, you take care of your heart, you take care of your relationship with God, you get that right, the bank account and all the rest of the material nonsense will take care of itself. Reminds me of an old Indian story, it's told, we'll call him Joe. The preacher's doing a big baptismal service. And everybody's getting baptized and old Joe raises his hand, he's in the back of the crowd on the shore and he says, Preacher, I want to be baptized. And the preacher said, well, come on, Joe, we'll baptize you too. And he said, just a minute. And he goes, back like this. And the preacher said, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting my wallet out. He said, no, leave it in there. We want to baptize it too. <laughs> you see, you get right with God. All this other stuff takes care of itself. But it's important. You rob yourself of a blessing. If you don't learn to give to God, both of yourself and whatever it is you, God's given you, you figure that out. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. Everything else takes care of itself when that's done honestly. And his promise is that he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. For you, such as there will not be room enough to receive it. Want to be blessed? It starts with you loving him with all your heart. Take care of your relationship. Relationship. Take care of your commitments. 
in Doug will take care of your wallet. It's quite a promise, huh? Cal, come to your guitar, if you would. If you'll do this, God says, and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that you will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, said the Lord of hosts. <coughs> Let your light shine like you've been washed with a fuller soap. Light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Whiter than the snow, the blood of Jesus washes away your sins and makes you whiter than snow. Does your glory, does your offering of yourself, your commitment, your relationship, does it glorify God? Does your giving glorify God? See, it really gets down to faith, doesn't it? It's down to faith. And it gets down to the real question, something about our wallet and our brain that just triggers a different way of thinking. It's really a pretty good test of where our heart is and how much faith we really have. I need to use what God has given me for his glory. What has God given you? And how are you using it? Wow. Pretty solemn question, isn't it? Let your light shine. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Everybody knew Eric Liddell when he ran that 400 meter. They wanted him for this and wanted him for that, wanted him to speak, wanted him to run other races, wanted him to do all those things. And he said, no, God has called me to do something else. And he went to be a missionary and died there. It sounds sad, but yet his daughters say it was glorious. It was wonderful to be his daughter, even though they weren't always able to be with him because he was in the mission field. And he made sure his family was safe. <coughs> it's quite a story. It's quite an illustration to us and what it takes. Father, we love you. Give you praise, we give you glory. We thank you for being such a loving God, a God that's willing, so full of grace and mercy, that you're willing just to say, you return to me and I'll return to you. You do what I ask you to do. You do what I've taught you to do. You use what I've given you, and I'll open up the windows of heaven and bless you like never before. Just be obedient to me. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will bless you. Lord, we ask for each and every one that's here just to minister to them. For those that are watching out there, minister to them too, Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Stand with me. What are we singing? All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I